Hello and welcome to Fabula Celtica, a Celtic studies podcast with Tyler Baxter and Michael Frim. Season one, Ancient Ireland, episode five, Incipit Berla Tabitha. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11. Welcome back to Fabula Celtica. I am Tyler Baxter. And I am Michael Frim. And we have just looked at uh, the uh, Tower of Babel story from the new international version of the Bible, which is freely available online. And uh, the reason that uh, we're bringing this story in, Michael, is because there is a legend about where the Irish language comes from and where it originated that deals with uh, the Tower of Babel and uses the Bible as sort of, I guess, a framework for composing that origin story upon. And within the frame of this podcast, last episode, we were looking at the material culture of the Celtic people to try and understand who they are, when did they get to Ireland, those kinds of questions. And now it's now we can look at how did the Irish people or various scholars within and outside of Ireland understand their own linguistic history. Exactly, yes. And so this is really continuing a discussion of the Iron Age in some sense, because the Iron Age seems to be when the language that evolved into Irish came to Ireland. But uh, emphasis on what you were saying about questions, because we still have a lot of questions about the actual details of how it came to be there. Also, uh, these are good microphones, and we have a fabulous editor, but if you hear strange noises in the background, that is our interns, uh, two, two lovely little six-month-old uh, kittens. So uh, don't, don't mind that too much, listeners. So uh, with the Tower of Babel story in mind, I want to look at a text, a manuscript called uh, The Scholar's Primer. And this consists of several uh, quote-unquote books that are each attributed to legendary authors. One of the oldest sections in The Scholar's Primer is uh, the book of Avergan Whiteney, uh, the son of Milesius. And this is another name for one of the sons of Meal, who are the final takers in the Book of the Taking of Ireland in the Lever Gavala Aaron, which we've been using kind of throughout our journey through Ireland's prehistory as our main framing legend. And we'll be finishing looking at the main bits of the Lever Gavala today, which is quite exciting. So the Scholar's Primer alleges that Gaelic was invented and singled out as an elite language by a number of scholars led by a Scythian man by the name of Phineas at the Tower of Nimrod or the Tower of Babel. The text says, quote, It was attributed to one man of them so that it is his name which is upon this language. That man was Gaithel, and so Gaithel, Gales, is derived from him from Gavel, son of Angan, son of Whiteney, end quote. So uh, this, this guy who they decided to name the language after um, is apparently related to this, this lead scholar, uh, or no, is apparently related, pardon, to um, Avergan Whiteney. Uh, they, they both have Whiteney in their, their epithets, uh, who is the, the person who, for whom this whole 
book, this whole section of the Scholar's Primer is, is named. Uh, now, before I get into the, the Scholar's Primer in any more detail, there's a few things that I want to clarify, including the title of this episode, um, which uh, for those of you who don't have either Latin or Old Irish may have sounded like a lot of weird stuff. Um, so the, the episode title today was Incipit is the, the first word. Uh, and this is the Latin word for it begins. So uh, at the beginning of many, many manuscripts during the Middle Ages, you would start a new section or a new story or a new book, in this case, with this word incipit. It's sort of a signal that says we're starting something new, even if the rest of your text is in a language besides Latin. Uh, and you would oftentimes also finish a section with finit, uh, which would mean it ends. And you still see finit at the ends of lots of modern day publications, movies, and so on. The uh, other part of the tile, title was Berla Tebitha, which is Old Irish for the selected language. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second, but essentially it is... Uh, the name that the scholar's primer gives for the original Gaelic or Irish language. And in the translations that we have of the scholar's primer that we'll be using today, uh, which come from uh, Calder, uh, translated in 1917, uh, because that's the one that's in the public domain, <laughs> uh, he will frequently translate uh, something that we, especially people in Ireland, would consider uh, the Irish language as the Gaelic language or the Goidelic language. Uh, and lots of present-day Irish people will think of Scottish Gaelic when you say Gaelic. So just to kind of clarify, Gaelic in this context means essentially the Gaelic branch of the Celtic languages, which would include Irish, it would include Scottish Gaelic, and it would include Manx as well. And Scottish Gaelic and Manx are both descended from an early form of Irish. So uh, this is sort of the proto-Irish language, I suppose, that, that we can think of uh, being discussed in this legend. So the Scholar's Primer uh, is a grammatical tract meant for an agus, the, uh, which is means a scholar and is oftentimes synony synonymous with a, a phila, a poet. Uh, and the, the, the text in Irish is called the Aurigept Nanagus, so the, the primer of the scholars. And within this text, uh, Calder says, quote, there is long excerpt from the Book of Avergan dealing with the origin of Goidelig. This passage is of earlier date and language than the general run of the tract, end quote. So Calder has identified this particular part that we're using to frame our discussion of the Irish language as one of the oldest parts of the Scholar's Primer in general. And to clarify a little earlier, I mean, a little further what we mean when we say the oldest, uh, a scholar named Alquist says, quote, the core of the text has been dated to a fairly early stage in the Old Irish period, end quote. And the Old Irish period, Michael, as you know, goes back to, say, roughly 600 um, as, as sort of the early part of it. And it goes up to around 800, 900 is, is when we're transitioning out of Old Irish and into Middle Irish. So um, we're looking at, if we're looking at a fairly early stage in the Old Irish period, we're talking about a text that could be dating back to the 7th century, which is, which is quite old indeed. Um, and here's what the scholars, the incipit of the scholar's primer is, so the beginning of this section of the scholar's primer. It says, incipit primer of the poets, that is aragept, beginning of lessons, for every beginning is ar. So there's sort of a pun that uh, the text begins with, where they're taking this first syllable of aragept, uh, and they're saying every beginning is er, which is probably, as far as I can make it out, seems to be a word usually spelled U-R or O-R uh, that means limit, brink, or border. 
And I think it's fair enough to say that a beginning is a sort of border or a sort of limit. So that that makes sense to me. So they're, they're sort of punning. They're making this sort of intellectual um, play on words at the beginning of the primer. And then they continue. Uh, there's this sort of rhetorical, rhetorical style that's used in a lot of Irish text where a question will be asked and then the answer is not difficult, nihansa, or not hard. Um, Even when the, the answer is quite difficult. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, in our last episode, uh, Michael was saying something about um, it being a difficult thing to answer these different questions. And I, I, I almost wanted to jump in and say... <laughs> Uh, something about this this format of oh, but usually the answer is not difficult in the, in the <laughs> medieval texts. Uh, so I, I wish that uh, we could just ask a medieval um, Irish uh, phila or or agus, a uh, medieval Irish intellectual, uh, these same questions that we're having about the Enigmatic Iron Age, because I bet they would say not difficult. Here's the here's the reason. Here's the tale, uh, and they would spin us a fabulous story that is, I'm sure, not true at all. But. Uh, so to, to kind of continue and pick up again on the on the primer, um, so it says, here's the beginning of the scholar's primer, and then it says, quote, to what is a beginning? Not difficult. This is the beginning which was invented by Phineas after the coming from the school with the languages from abroad. Every obscure sound that existed in every speech and in every language was put into Gaelic, so that for this reason it is more comprehensive than any other language, end quote. So, uh, bravely, I would say, uh, the, the origin story here is that Phineas and his scholars took every sound that they could find from every language that they knew of, and they all put it into one thing. And that's, that's the starting point of Gaelic, which uh, they think is a great idea because that makes it comprehensive. Um, to me, that sounds, well, rough uh, as far as trying to construct a language out of that. Language aren't languages aren't really created. They're not invented by you know one person or a group of people. Well, uh, uh, the medieval folks would disagree with you, Michael. <laughs> um, but it's for this reason that the language gets the name Berla Tebitha, the selected language. Uh, the Tebitha bit comes from a verb doepin, which means to cut out or to select. So they've cut out the bits of other languages that they want, and they've put it into this new language. Uh, in modern Irish, Berla has come to mean English, the English language, but it used to be the word just for language in general. All right, uh, continuing on, quote, Query then, did not Gaelic exist before it was selected? It did indeed, for the 72 languages are not found otherwise, end quote. So uh, in other words, not only does Gaelic have every other bit of every other language you could hope for, but it's actually the original language. This is the language that was around, the single unified language, before the Tower of Babel fell. Uh, a few other little extracts from this that I particularly enjoy, just to, to quote them if, and uh, give you an idea of what the, the uh, original composers of the, of the Scholar's Primer thought of their language. Quote, what was best according of every language and was what was whitest and finest was selected for Gaelic. And, and for every sound for which no characters were found in all the other alphabets, characters were by them found for these in the Ogham. Therefore, its vowels were placed apart and its consonants also apart, so that every one of them stands apart from the other. End quote. And I think this is significant in that it is telling us so uh, just as a really quick background for listeners we're going to talk about this in more detail in a future episode but oam in modern irish or ogham in old irish uh, are the it's a a method of writing that is made by scoring a number of, of notches or lines uh, onto the edge of a pillar stone essentially and uh, it's uh, sort of a, it really maps to Latin letters. Uh, so we know that it's largely based on the Latin alphabet, uh, but arranged kind of for a particularly Irish usage. And these are earliest forms of writing that we have that are native to Ireland. 
And so what this uh, particular quote is saying is it's acknowledging this idea that the creators of the legendary creators of the Irish language were able to isolate these individual phonemes, really these individual sound bite bits and, and put them into the form of an alphabet, uh, which is, is worth thinking about when you think about the different ways that a language can be written down. Alphabets aren't the only type of writing system out there. We also have, um, syllabaries so so systems where you have syllable based symbols rather than um, letters that indicate individual phonemes um, so that would be Japanese for example is a really good example of that each uh, symbol in hiragana or katakana represent a syllable um, you actually get continental Celtic languages uh, such as uh, hispano Celtic or Celtiberian where they use a syllable based, um, writing system rather than a alphabet based writing system um, and then of course there are languages like uh, Chinese for instance where symbols can represent an entire word in and of themselves and just to expand the imagination for how how people can write uh, some scholars have even argued that the quipus of the Incan Empire were used for writing, writing generally as well as you know, numerical recording, and that's a that's a not based recording system. That's very much, very much the cutting edge of Incan research, um, and certainly not definitively decided or proven. But an idea has been put out there that even knots could be used for for writing. Yeah, and I mean in. The early use of, of Greek alphabet characters, for instance, those characters could represent either a sound or they could represent a number as well. So, yeah, we, we definitely have cases where, where something like that happens. I, yeah, I, I, you scratched a very distant memory in the back of my mind about, <laughs> about knots as, as a way of, of communicating language. Um, so that's, that's a very good little addition, I think. So what we have specifically here then is an acknowledgement of an alphabetic system, but not only an alphabetic system, an alphabetic system that has picked all the best bits from other languages and has found a way to um, write them down even when other languages haven't. So it's, it's really trying to up the prestige of Irish and how amazing it really is. Yeah, the theme, the theme here is really... Irish, Irish is the best. Gaelic is the best. This, you know, proto-Irish language is not only not only did it take all of the best parts of all of the other languages, it was also the originator of all of the other languages, which is kind of an impossible, impossible contradiction. But in the context of we want to make we want to make this history, even if it can't be, even if it cannot be factual, we want to make this history as extravagant as magnificent as we can. It makes perfect sense to have this kind of impossibility of not only is it the best of all the other languages, it, not only did it take from all the other languages specifically, implying a kind of chronology there, it was also the creator of those languages implying the opposite chronology. Yes, yes. Uh, and there's, I think we frequently encounter a paradox within the Irish legends, and I, I that's one of my favorite things about them, actually, is, is this these paradoxes that come in and usually it's in the context of some sort of other world magic going on but uh in in this case it's more of a, a paradox of how they've set things up and what they're saying about this language and and i, I really honestly think it's lovely rather than frustrating <laughs> um something else that may be less paradox and more just that the scribe couldn't count uh there's this this lovely metaphor that the scribe attempts to make uh about the building of the Tower of Babel and how this relates to the grammar of Irish. So here's the next little quote. Only nine materials were in the Tower of Babel, that is clay and water, wool and blood, wood and lime, acacias or wattle, and flax thread and bitumen, that is noun, pronoun, verb, adverb, participle, conjunction, preposition and interjection end quote so the the scribe is attempting to set up this really lovely idea that 
the language itself is like the construction of the Tower of Babel. It's been put together very intentionally, and here are the key elements to it. But he lists nine materials for the Tower of Babel, and then only eight <laughs> different types of sort of pieces of grammar for, for the language. So he's, he's short one. He needs to find something else to put in there. Uh, he lost count, apparently, at some point. Um, and then one, one more line here. Quote, query. Was there not among the many languages something nobler to take precedence of Gaelic? Not difficult. No, indeed, on account of its aptness, lightness, smoothness, and comprehensiveness, end quote. And uh, as anyone who studies Irish uh, or speaks Irish knows, Irish is indeed the most smooth and uh, most light, uh, most apt of all languages, Definitely no weird articulations at any point. Um, it's, it's truly, truly musical. Um, so this same story about Phineas leading the creation, uh, or I guess the sort of making Irish a... I guess the prescription of the Irish language, really kind of nailing down uh, its different key elements, nailing down uh, a way to write it, uh, making it a language that's not only spoken, but a language with all the different qualities of a language that you could need. Uh, this same story is conveyed in the Lever Gavala, in the Book of Invasions, with the sort of setup to the final group of people to come and take Ireland, who are known as the Sons of Meal or the Milesians. And uh, the Milesians uh, don't include Meal himself. They are his sons. So we have uh, a few who I'll name. I'm not going to name all of them, but I'm going to mention Don, who is the eldest of the group, and he is sort of portrayed as a leader and a warrior. We have Avergan Whiteney or Avergan Gluengel, uh, who is described as a druid, which would be, in origin, the priest of a native or pre-Christian religion in in Ireland and in Britain and in uh, the continent as well. We have we have cognate words for for druid in all our our Celtic um, areas, really, but uh, it does come to be used almost synonymously with sort of like a wizard so we we do have to kind of be careful about exactly what this word might mean but he, he's described as a druid in any case uh, as well as described as a poet and judge so we have don the the warrior leader we have avergan the poet and judge and then we have a whole list of other children uh, of meal other sons of meal whose names all seem to relate to or to be based upon the word for Ireland. So we have Ir, Erich, Ernon, and Erevon, who all seem to have their names based upon Eru, based upon the, the old Irish word for Ireland. And then we have Aver, whose name seems to be based upon Hibernia, which is the Latin name, the classical name for Ireland. So uh, these People all uh, are quite clearly, I think, uh, l truly legendary and uh, are named for the place for, to which they're going with, with a handful of exceptions. Now, the Sons of Meal begin uh, at the Tower of Babel. Um, and there's this whole story about how the Irish language comes to be. And these people take that Irish language with them after the fall of the Tower of Babel into, uh, well, from Mesopotamia, I suppose, which is the traditional location of the Tower of Babel. They go through Egypt. So presumably they kind of cut across um, from Mesopotamia into Egypt and then must go up into the Mediterranean and, and sail from there uh, and eventually arrive in Spain. And while they're hanging out in Spain, one of them goes to the top of a tower from which he's able to see Ireland. 
He's like, wow, there's an island out there. That looks great. Uh, now, how he has the the vision necessary to see Ireland from such dis- distance, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Maybe Ireland was a little closer to Spain back in the day, or maybe this tower is ridiculously tall. And uh, also, uh, for one um, rare occasion, Ireland isn't covered in, in fog and storm clouds. Uh, but he, he sees Ireland from Spain anyways, and... Uh, manages to to convince all the rest of the sons of meal to go to ireland and to check it out and uh, see what they can get there when they come into ireland they seem to come in um in perhaps the southwest strangely enough uh because they meet these three different goddesses on three different hilltops and as far as i can tell uh they go from the southwest at a uh, mountain called Slave Mish in County Kerry uh, up into kind of um, the the middle, kind of the lower middle of, of Ireland in, in County Tipperary, though that location is a little bit hard to, to pin down. Um, and then they end at Ishnach in uh, modern-day County Westmeath, uh, which is fairly close to, to Tara in County Meath uh, next door. And uh, so they, they get into Ireland, they meet these three goddesses one after the other. The goddesses are named Bamba, Fodla, and Eru. And each time they meet one of these goddesses, the goddesses ask the sons of Meal to give the island of Ireland their name, so the name of that goddess, and in exchange, the goddess will grant their favor to the sons of Meal. When they get to the third goddess, Eru, uh, Eru tells the sons of Meal that the land will be theirs forever. But Don, the warrior leader, the eldest of the sons of Meal, defies this welcome and says, no, no, I want to conquer Ireland by force. I don't want it to just be handed to me. And we have to remember that uh, the Tuatha de Don and the fifth takers of Ireland are still in power in Ireland at this time. There is a fragment in one version of this tale where Eru actually at this point goes to battle with the sons and she creates these men out of the earth around her, these golems, I suppose, uh, and they're stuck fighting these things until their own druids on the, on the sides of the sons of Meal and their own poets uh, can disenchant the earthen soldiers that, that Eru has created. They uh, manage to, to get past this encounter, and they proceed to Tara, where they meet three kings who appear to be ruling simultaneously, uh, three kings of the Tuatha de Danann. The Tuatha de Danann are not immediately hostile, at least not uh, in, in any overt way. They actually tell Abergan, who is, again, the, the poet and druid of the Sons of Meal, that um, they will submit to him and they will submit to the rule of the Sons of Meal unless Abergan gives a false judgment. And the fact that it is Abergan that the Tuatha de Danann are um, negotiating with, I think, perhaps ties into his role as a druid where he would be the person who is sort of in the role of a mediator with the gods if we take druid as meaning that that older sort of role as the pre-christian um, priestly class and Abergan's judgment is the following he says quote let this island be left to them how far shall we go, said Ever. Past just nine waves, said Avergan. This is the first judgment given in Ireland, end quote. So this is in volume five of McAllister's uh, Lever Gavala, Aaron. Now, uh, in the Irish legendary texts, very frequently, I would say perhaps more often than not, we get an intermixing of both prose and verse versions of the story we're dealing with or we'll get prose where they introduce a poem that is then spoken 
And very frequently, the poetic language that we're given is older uh, than the language of the prose. And it can almost seem in some cases, and perhaps is the case even, that the prose narrative is constructed around these older verses that manage to uh, be conveyed with more faithfulness to a earlier point in time thanks to the rules of of meter and rhyme and alliteration and so on. Something that happens not just in Ireland as well, I think in Icelandic literature and Japanese literature, certainly you get poems that have prose constructed around them. Seemingly, you know, the, the poems were kept in the cultural memory, were, were kept in the narrative tradition, and then the prose was added on, perhaps as explanatory, perhaps as part of the story explaining where does this poem come from. Um, so interesting that the poetic tradition globally kind of has this has this prose explanatory or prose frame around it. Yes, and I think it speaks to the idea of poets retaining, well, holding and retaining a very important role in Irish society throughout the medieval period. Really, they it's it's not until more recent times that poets kind of become what we see them as today back in the and we'll, we'll talk about the the phila, the the poets of ireland in another episode in detail but they are a type of person who comes into a huge number of our legendary texts they're very important in our law texts um, they're just present everywhere and i think that speaks to the importance of um, both intellectualism and the oral culture that all of this has originated out of. Uh, it's, it's thanks to those aspects of, of rhyme and meter that poets are able to memorize so much of the lore that they carry around with them. They're sort of the, the living libraries of the day. They, uh, they were really more than just composing, you know, com composers of poetry. They were keepers and purveyors of knowledge yes. and poems. Yes. knowing where they came from and the stories around them. So they more than just poets, they were the historians, they were the scholars, they were... Phila is a, is a, it's a very broad term yes. for, for this class. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they, they're really holders of shenichis, which is this very broad word that's usually translated as lore, but it's, it's both... It's traditional lore, it's historical knowledge, it's, uh, it's sort of... Well, it, it includes like place lore. We've already talked in multiple episodes about the din henicus. That's a compound word between din, which means notable place, and shenicus, uh, meaning this this lore, this tradition, this great knowledge. And so the the phila have a much wider role than just to write fancy poetry uh, and try to become the poet laureate. Uh, it's, it's, it's so much more than that. And they have a great deal of, of status and legal authority uh, and really are perceived as having magical powers. So this all brings us to, a, um, to an example of some old Irish verse within the story of the taking of the sons of meal so i read the prose version of the judgment that he gives we're supposed to sail out past nine waves and then we'll come back and if we are successful then we get to take ireland from the two of the and that's basically a synopsis of what african has has just said but we also get a verse version of this that's um, a little bit more involved so uh for the benefit of the audience i'm actually going to read uh, the Old Irish uh, in the original language for this as best I can. Um, and then we'll give you the translation. Avergan Kekinit. Fyrtorkta Twinada. Darnoe Tona Mara Manglasa. Ni Ragiv Mandev Kamachatakiv. Klantar Kriv Arlektar Kath. Konkertiv Twinada. Tirtarktaver. Ma Karaj, David Kerd, Muna Karaj, Na David, Nime Asper Friv, Muna Baldiv. So translated, that is 
So Avrigan Kekinit, there's another Latin word coming in, um, and it is a word that can mean to sing or to chant or to recite or even to foretell. Uh, and in Old Irish, there is a cognate word. Um, well, actually, I'm not sure if it's cog. I think it's cognate. Yeah, yeah. We've got a non-radical N in Kenneth, right, uh, Michael? So um, there's a at least there's a verb with the same range of meanings in in Old Irish, which is conneth. Uh, and in Welsh, we also have a word with the same range of meanings, which is "cani." So uh, this this idea that when you speak poetry, it's almost always with this particular verb that can have all these different meanings. So Avrigan sings or recites or foretells even. Uh, and here's what the rest of the poem is in English. Men seeking a possession over nine great green-shouldered waves, ye shall not go unless with powerful gods. Be it settled swiftly, be battle permitted. I adjust the possession of the land to which ye have come. If ye like it, not, if you like it, adjudge the right to the land. If ye like it not, adjudge it not. I say it not to you, except with your good will. So, really, I guess what he is saying here uh, seems to be that they are the sons of Mill who are seeking the possession of Ireland are going to sail away over nine waves and they're only going to be successful with the goodwill of the gods. And he is wants to adjust the possession of the land, so he wants to trade the holding of the land, the, the sovereignty of the land from its current possessors, the Tuatha de Danann, to the sons of Mil. Um, and he's saying to the Tuatha de Danann, if you like this judgment, judge the right. So give us the right to the land. And if you don't, then don't. Um, and I'm asking for your goodwill in this, in this rather strange judgment I'm making. I'm going to sail away a few waves and then I'm going to come back. Uh, but that, that is what it comes out to. So the text continues in prose now, and it says, quote, Then they went out past nine waves. The druids of Ireland and the poets of the Tuatha de Danann sang spells behind them so that they were carried far from Ireland and were in distress by reason of the sea. A wind of wizards is this, said Aver. Said Don, the eldest, This is a disgrace for our men of cunning, said he. Tis no disgrace, said Avergan. And he spake a poem, and a calming of the wind came to them forthwith." End quote. Now, I think the poem that Avergan speaks, and which the text does give to us, is very, very informative. So I'm going to read just the English version of this, uh, of this poem. I seek the land of Ireland, coursed be the fruitful sea, fruitful the ranked highland, ranked the showery wood, showery the river of cataracts. Of cataracts, the lake of pools, of pools, the hill of a well, of a well, of a people of assemblies, of assemblies of the king of Tever, Tever, hill of peoples, peoples of the sons of Meal, of Meal, of ships, of barks, the high ship Eru, Eru, lofty, very green, an incantation, very cunning, the great cunning of the wives of Bresh, of Bresh, of the wives of Bugna, the mighty lady Eru, Erevon harried her, Ear, Aver, sought for her, I seek the land of Ireland." End quote. Now, um, I have some particular thoughts about what's going on in this poem, but Michael, I don't know if there's anything that um, immediately strikes you when you're reading that. Just that there must be so, so many layers that are going into the poem um, that the creators of this poem, the purveyors of the poem, must may have been aware of i you know i would love to to ask them what's going on here you know what what are these cataracts and pools and wells mm -hmm, how are mm -hmm, they all connected mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um there must be so many layers here and also you know in the the story of don and avergain um mm -hmm. you really get this contrast between the warrior wanting to fight yes. and the wise poet wanting to be diplomatic yes uh just an interesting awareness of these two sides of leadership. Yes, yes, I think so. Um, and uh, we, as, as you're saying, there are sort of 
um, I suppose, allusions within this this poem to other areas of tradition. For example, Bresh is a character who is very significant in Kathmagatura, the second battle of Magturith, which I am hoping we can look at at the end of this season of the podcast. Um, so we will get there, folks. And I've, I've mentioned it a few times, but it's a, essentially a, a story about uh, the... Uh, a war between the Tuatha de Danann and the Fovra, uh, who we encountered in a few of our earlier takings. Um, and Bresh is a character who, like the god Lug, is descended from both uh, Fovra and Tuatha de Danann parentage. So he's he's being discussed here in this in this text in this uh, in this poem. But the thing that I really want to point out here is that to me this seems to be. And I think the reason this poem is effective is this seems to be a praise poem to Eru, to Ireland. And it's effectively a poem that begins, I seek the land of Ireland, course be the fruitful sea, you know, it's got all these descriptions of the landscape and it's praising the landscape. And then about uh, two thirds of the way through, it transitions from talking about Ireland in terms of the landscape to talking about Eru and naming Eru specifically. Um, and I think it's kind of this subtle shift from looking at praising Ireland as a landscape to praising this goddess who they met on a hilltop who said the land will be theirs and sh that she will give them her favor. So I think what's happening here is Avergan is singing a praise poem to Eru. He's calling upon this god who has already promised favoritism to the sons of Meal and that it is really her power that is calming uh, or, or sort of disenchanting the spells that have been cast up against them by the Tuatha de Danann, who don't want them to return. So, in other words, the land itself is accepting them. Uh, and thanks to this, the ship is able to return back to the land, uh, and the Tuatha de Danann have to acknowledge that Avergan's judgment was true, and therefore they have to hand over control of Ireland to the Sons of Meal. There's a uh, few sort of almost epilogue aspects to this final taking in the Lever of Gavala that I want to bring up because it will come into future uh, episodes and future legends. So this is some background that will be useful. Some of the Sons of Meal being sort of the original Irish people, the, the first of the Gales, I suppose, uh, to come to Ireland, these are supposed to be the ancestors of the modern-day Irish, some of them are taken as sort of the legendary progenitors of various uh, royal or noble lines in the medieval period. So, for example, uh, Ear, one of the uh, sons whose name is based off of the, the name for Ireland, based off the name Eru, uh, is taken as the legendary ancestor of the dynasty of the Ulid, of the, of the Ulster dynasty during the medieval period. Um, similarly, Erevon uh, is taken as the legendary ancestor of three different important dynasties, of the Enail clan, of the Connacht dynasty, and of the Leinster dynasty. And Aver, uh, whose name is based on the Latin name for Ireland, Hibernia, is taken as the ancestor of the Munster dynasty. So the, these, these various groups who gained power at some point during the Middle Ages looked back to their legendary past and said, we're going to claim this guy. And this would give them um, a certain amount of legendary prestige and, and it would give them legitimacy. It's like we've our, our family has been here and has been in power in Ireland since the very beginning of humans in Ireland, since the very beginning of the Gales in Ireland. So it's trying to sort of justify um, their current position in the medieval period. It's also having these kinds of genealogies from legendary, legendary families, really, of Brother A being the progenitor mm -hmm. of, of this ethnic group or this, you know, territorial group. Mm -hmm. Um, Brother B being this other, the progenitor of this other group, very biblical, very reminiscent mm -hmm. of, of some aspects of, of Genesis, um, which I think also speaks to some of the structure of the Lever Gavala mm -hmm. um, being 
I wouldn't say structured akin to, but but certainly in some ways reminiscent of the Bible. Um, and I, I, I'm sure it's it's been discussed and argued in the secondary literature, but I'm aware that some people have have thought of the Lever Gavala as restructuring Irish mytho history in a kind of biblical way, um, and in the context of how do we understand the transition from a native Irish mythology, a pre-Christian Irish mythology being written, being discussed, being preserved in a Christian medieval Ireland, reworking these mm-hmm. mythological beings, mm-hmm. which may have even been derived from prehistoric gods into a Christian framework, this kind of euhemerism or demonization also, or just general adaptation of these beings into the history, making them non-divine historical beings is one way that these Christian authors may have been adapting that his- that mythology, that those belief systems into mm-hmm. a newly Christian framework. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good point. Um, and we have a really good example, actually, of that idea of euhemerism, which just to explain for people who haven't heard this word before, it's sort of the idea of retroactively sort of rewriting divine characters or, or magical characters as as just being human with sort of an uh, an outsized uh, reputation, I supposed. Uh, so it's, it's sort of they just have a very good reputation and become magical as a result of it in, in later tellings. Um, so it's trying to rationalize sort of, you know, pagan gods or things of that nature. And we see a really good example of that in the beginning of the fifth taking with the two of the Dedanin coming in, where they're described as people who learn sorcery in the islands of the north as a way to explain their magical powers. They're not they're not said to be gods, even though God is in their name, uh, but they are people who learn sorcery. That's the reason they have magic, and then they come back to Ireland. Um, they're they're one of the the descendants of the, the people of the third taking, so that's that's why I say come back. Even though within the secondary literature now, it seems pretty certain that at least some members of the Tuatha Dé Danann derive from pre-Christian Celtic gods. Luke, exactly. for instance, yeah. based on place name evidence in various Celtic places, including on the continent, seems to be a really major god in the Celtic pantheon. And he is a, also a major character in the Tuatha Dé Danann. Yes, yes. Um, and we're going to have to, uh, uh, at some point, I do want to do an episode where we're really trying to pick apart um, the whole idea of a Celtic pantheon and and exactly how good or bad that particular phraseology is. Um, but look at some of these connections between uh, different figures that we see in Ireland versus on the continent or in Britain um, or both and look at sort of this idea of the interpretatio romano, this the, the Roman interpretation of Celtic gods, uh, sort of this parallelism that draws, uh, that is drawn between Celtic divinities and Roman ones, um, and look also at, at divinities who seem to be totally unique to Ireland as well, uh, without any, any other associations known elsewhere. Um, so this this whole idea of um of the sons of meal being the progenitors of the the modern day irish um doesn't totally displace the importance of the two of the uh, as we know they they continue to appear in many many stories even after the uh, i guess the gales are the the main uh, rulers of ireland and are the people who are in power we have a story called The Intoxication of the Ulsterman, which is not primarily about this, but sets up at the beginning of the story that the wisdom of the Milesians, of the Sons of Mill, prevailed over the Tuatha de Danann, and as a result, Ireland was left to be divided between the Tuatha de Danann and the Sons of Mill by Avergan, again, and uh, supposedly divided evenly. But Avergan uh, judges that the sons of Meal get to take the upper half of Ireland and the Tuatha de Danann get the lower half of Ireland, or in other words, 
he's regulating the Tuatha Dé Danann into underground. And this ties back into that idea of the connection between these other world people and the Shiva, the, the hollow hills or the elf mounds, whatever you want to call them. And that word sheath being a word that can mean either one of these, these mounds or can be a general word for the other world or a general word even for the underworld. So we get a nice little bit of extra information in this story about how the Tuatha Dé Danann go from being the rulers of Ireland to a people who are living in this, this uh, subterranean underworld or other world. Um, and just to add a little bit to that, uh, in yet another story of the taking of the hollow hill, there is a point at which there is a treaty signed between the human population of Ireland and the Tuatha Dé Danann so that the Tuatha Dé Danann will preserve the land's grain and milk, essentially preserve the land's fertility, which suggests that the Tuatha Dé Danann still are respected and still hold a great deal of power. And I'd also add in a lot of these stories during this imagined time period of mytho history where the Tuatha Dé Danann and the Sons of Meal are coexisting after this division when uh, when they're given the, the lower half, meaning the underground area of Ireland, um, often you see the Tuatha Dé Danann being associated with the major prehistoric forts, the major prehistoric mm -hmm. hills that exist on the landscape. New Grange, for instance, Evan Vacha, or maybe not Evan Vacha, but certainly, uh, certainly. I mean, I, I would say we could associate it with Evan Vacha. In addition to the story in the last episode about Macha Mongruith, Macha of the Red Tresses, who, even though it wasn't explicitly stated, she had a lot of qualities of what we might call a sovereignty goddess, which is a figure we're going to be looking at in. Um, our episode about Tara, uh, which I think we'll be doing in our next episode, actually. Um, but uh, she has a lot of qualities of an otherworld woman. Um, and there is another story where it's much more explicit um, about how Evan Vacha gets its name that's, that's different, but also involves a woman named Vacha who is very explicitly from the other world. So there's definitely a connection there. And at the very least, Newgrange for sure and some of the other yes. Neolithic monuments that are existing on the landscape mm -hmm. are implied to be the, the seats of power for the most powerful members of the Tuatha Dé Danann. Yes. So it seems, at least in the medieval conception, these sites still had significance as underground places where the Tuatha Dé Danann were living, were ruling from. So just to add to that yes. understanding of what is the underground in the medieval conception, it could be under these under these hills, under these yes. under yes. these Neolithic constructions. Yes. Yeah. We also get this idea of a connection to the underworld. Um, so so I would say the, the Shiva, the the hills are are one of the biggest foci, I suppose, of underworld connection or other world connection, but we also get associations with the other world through bodies of water. Um, there's sort of just this idea of going into, going under, going deep. Uh, and that may even connect perhaps tangentially or to the idea of what we were talking about in the last episode with depositing um, precious uh, items into deep places such as bogs. Perhaps this is an attempt to give these objects over to the other world. And that conception of the other world being a place that is deep may have existed from long before we even have these stories in, in a written form. And this is also to emphasize there's kind of this universal idea of liminal places being the, the places where humans can interact with the supernatural, with the other world. Hills are liminal, liminal places in and of themselves as things that reach from the ground into the sky mm -hmm. as protrusions of the underground into the above ground. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that mounds would be very significant, uh, lakes, bodies of water, mm -hmm. coastlines, mm -hmm. the, the, the threshold between land and water, another mm -hmm. liminal place, mm -hmm. bogs, yep. the, the, the combination of water and earth, another threshold between realms. So all of these liminal places being the ways that humans can interact with, can meet 
the pre or the the I shouldn't say the prehistoric gods, but the supernatural in the minds of mm-hmm. of the medieval people um, makes sense, and is that is a universal idea throughout throughout storytelling. Yes, and and as we'll see as we continue going along through this this series, and I'm sure even in future series. Um, this idea of liminality is not only one that has to do with places in the landscape. It's also one that has to do with things like weather phenomena. We see a lot of connection with, say, fog as creating this sort of liminality. And that is oftentimes the context in which the other world is encountered. Um, we also see sp- certain times of year that are considered to be liminal, such as Sovin or Sawin, um, Halloween being this time sort of between seasons. And uh, each of the really what are called the cross quarter days or, or the, the Celtic fire festivals, um, these are, are times that are exactly halfway between a solstice and an equinox. So they're, they're very much a liminal place temporally. And uh, again, we see other world connections at um, these these times of year. So I think this brings us to a point where we can transition into talking a little bit, just just relatively briefly, about the history of the Irish language more generally. Um, to just give a brief introduction to the idea of how languages are viewed uh, by modern scholars um, for our audience, languages are seen very much as things that uh, start from kind of a common place and, and branch out into new languages, much like a family tree. So um, the Celtic languages are a branch of what we call Indo-European. Uh, which is a very large language group. I think it's actually the largest uh, language group uh, in the world in terms of the number of people who speak an Indo-European language. And the language in theory goes all the way back to a language that we call Proto-Indo-European now that is not attested, so we've never there's there's no written evidence of this language. We've never heard a person speak Proto-Indo-European, but by looking at languages that are in this language family, we can see there are a whole bunch of similarities between them that suggest that they come from a common ancestor, essentially. And Celtic is just one of these many branches. Other Indo-European languages that people might be familiar with are the Germanic languages, so English, for instance, which we're speaking right now. Um, the Italic languages, which would include Latin and Latin's various descendants, which are the Romance languages, so we're looking at Italian, Spanish, French. Um, and we also have, so that's kind of on the, oh, I guess the, the Slavic languages too, Russian, Polish, and so on. Um, and we have that's kind of the European side of Indo-European, but there's also an Indo-Iranian side of Indo-European where you're getting into um, Sanskrit, for in- instance, being one of the, the old languages uh, and really important to Indo-Europeanists in, in terms of study of these old languages. Um, but you also get uh, the Iranian languages like Persian. Um, you get the Indic languages like Hindi and and so on. So there's many, many languages that seem to relate to this this common ancestor. And within the Celtic branch, we have uh, quite a bit of disagreement exactly about how they break down from each other. But if we ignore exactly how they're related in terms of their ancestry, um, the Celtic languages are generally grouped for convenience into two main categories. Uh, One are the continental Celtic languages, which are now all extinct. Um, These would include Celtiberian or Hispano-Celtic, Galatian, Gaulish, Lepontic, which may just be an earlier form of a Gaulish language, um, and Noric are are probably the the biggest ones there. Um, And then we have the insular Celtic languages, which include the sort of proto-Irish and proto-British languages that eventually become modern-day Irish, Manx, and Scottish De- Gaelic on the on the Irish or Gaelic or Goidelic side, and become uh, Welsh, Cornish, and Breton on the British or Brythonic side. I must say, when I first learned that Irish was related to Hindi, 
it really, uh, when I first learned that English was related to Hindi, it really blew my mind. And some of the implications here are that people can draw and really like to draw connections between Sanskrit stories or stories written in Sanskrit and stories written in Irish to try and understand, you know, stories that existed in the proto-Indo-European times that have diffused and spread to all of these Indo-European languages. Really yeah, incredible how vast this language family is. Yeah, and I mean, at the very least, it's exciting to find like i suppose uh, as, as a really simple example this might seem very natural to people but if you think about it it's 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 very meaningful that there are certain words in the languages that we now classify as indo-european that pretty much all the languages in that category share um with, or have uh, cognate with um, a cognate is a is just a word that means that they're, they're different words in different languages, but they share a common ancestor. And um, there are certain cognates that seem to go all the way back to this theorized Proto-Indo-European language, such as the word for mother, the word for father, brother, sister, um, which suggests that all the way back when Proto-Indo-European was being spoken, the sort of biological family unit was a really important thing and that cultural element of that group of language speakers continued to be important to speakers of the modern Indo-European languages. And that's not necessarily something that we can take for granted in every culture in the world. There are cultures where it's not so much the biological family unit that matters, it's oftentimes maybe the community that takes care of, um, uh, of new children and that sort of thing. So um, there, there are words like that. Those are the easiest ones to, to go and look at the different variations in your languages and see how they're, they're related to each other. But uh, there, there are other words that also give us a sense of, oh, this also seems to have been impro important to Indo-European cultures as far as back as this proto-Indo-European idea. How does language, how does culture inform language and how does language inform culture? Exactly. Uh, if, if I was a medieval Irish person, I would say not difficult, <laughs> um, but I think it is uh, still quite difficult. Uh, so Proto-Indo-European, to give people an idea of the timeline, there's quite a range of ideas about when it was being spoken. I've seen people theorizing it was being spoken as far back as 8,000 BCE. I have seen people saying it's being spoken at 4,500 BCE. So it's hard to tell exactly when we're talking about for the origin of this Proto-Indo-European language speaking group. But we do have a sense that roughly about 3,500 BCE, we start to get a series of migrations from the Indo-European heartland, wherever that was. There's a, a few predominant theories about it, uh, but most, very roughly, I could say uh, somewhere between the, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea seems to be kind of the main consensus, um, a little bit north and, and between those. But uh, wherever this homeland was, there seems to have been a, a series of migrations around 3500 BCE into different areas of Europe and Asia. And as these people spread apart from each other and lost contact with each other, their languages evolved in different ways. And so it's the descendants of those, of those who migrated, um, the descendants of their languages that develop into the various Indo-European languages that we see now. And given that it takes time for new languages to develop, we can estimate that the earliest that a language that we could really call Celtic began would have been about 1000 BCE. So to give people kind of a mental map of um, how the Proto-Indo-European uh, spread and how the Celtic languages spread across Europe. Um, the Proto-Indo-European languages uh, begin kind of at the sort of 
eastern border of between Europe and Asia, I suppose, uh, and they they spread fairly evenly out um, in all directions from there, uh, going pretty much all the way across Europe, uh, going down towards towards India, uh, not so much up into Russia. Um, it, from about uh, between so 4500 BCE as if we take that as our starting point for Proto-Indo-European to about 500 um, BCE at that point we're looking at Indo-European getting into to Britain, Ireland and the Iberian Peninsula so it, it takes you know thousands of years for them to spread out uh, across this distance but they, they eventually do get there uh, the Celtic languages, which we can be on sure footing with because we have these languages attested in inscriptions and, and so forth, um, are attested across the, the bulk of Europe and uh, into sort of the, the Balkans and, and, as I mentioned, I think in the last episode, even into uh, Asia Minor uh, by around 200 BCE. And at that point, we've also seen them come into Britain and we've seen them come into Ireland. Um, again, we're not 100% sure on exactly when they when they get into Britain and Ireland, but we do know it's during the Iron Age. So, so by about 200 BCE, we can be fairly certain that the Celtic languages are being spoken in these places. And then something happens that causes the Celtic languages that are being spoken across this huge chunk of the world to retract considerably. And that is um, the heart of a TikTok trend that's about a year old now, the Roman Empire. <laughs> there it is, I said it. Uh, so the Roman Empire uh, expands. Uh, Michael actually uh, Oh, oh gosh, I think it was last episode, uh, said, uh, was, was talking about Caesar's conquest of Gaul, and that's a huge uh, part of this. But the Roman Empire spreads from where they were, kind of just around the perimeter of the Mediterranean um, in, you know, about 120, 60 BCE, and by about uh, 200 CE, say, uh, they've spread all the way up in across Europe. They've essentially pushed out uh, the native language of the Gauls. They've uh, made it all the way into Britain, and they're pushing the Celtic speakers from kind of across Britain into the periphery. So we're getting uh, the majority of the language pressure exerted by Roman occupation uh, in sort of the, the east and, and the heart of modern-day Britain, where well, as, whereas in um, the highlands of Scotland, uh, which the, the Romans never conquered, uh, we still have people who are able to speak their native Celtic languages in kind of the more uh, fringes of, of Wales and Cornwall, which are sort of the extreme edges of the island, we're able to get people continuing to speak their Celtic languages. Um, but even after Rome leaves Britain, uh, of course, immediately the, well, almost immediately, the uh, Anglo-Saxons are, are coming in and the same pressures are applying. So we move from this point at which Celtic is being spoken across the majority of Europe in one form or another to a point where it's been pushed to the fringes of Britain and Ireland, which Rome never attempted to conquer. And uh, that's how we get to the point we're at today, where we've just got Wales, Cornwall, Ireland, Scotland, uh, Isle of Man, and Brittany, that little peninsula um, just south of Cornwall in modern day France, uh, where these languages are still spoken actively. Okay, well, uh, that's all I had for this uh, particular topic. Michael, any last thoughts before we? No, that sounds great. The history of the Irish and Britonic languages 
in the minds of the Irish and in the minds of modern day scholars, yes. a very expansive topic. Yes, and uh, they, they are very different uh, outlooks, I would say, between uh, the modern scholars and uh, the, the early Irish oh, scholars. Oh, just a little bit, just a just, little just bit. Just a little bit. Um, so we are rapidly approaching the point at which we are going to be looking at the transition into the medieval period, but we have one last topic to talk about from Iron Age Ireland. Um, in the context, of course, of medieval legend, and that is the Hill of Tara. So that will be the next episode, and uh, that will set us up for talking about the arrival of St. Patrick. Thank you for listening to Fabula Celtica with Tyler Baxter and Michael Frim. Follow us at Fabula Celtica on Twitter, Instagram, or Blue Sky, or email us at fabulaceltica at gmail.com.